Shalom Israel. We are back again. I hope everything is going well on your end. So today we have the fourth installment of Dark ETs, Angels and Chariots of God, The Untold Story. Again, that is part four. We have a very special video for you guys today. This is some incredible first-hand footage of an abductee from Puerto Rico named Amori Rivera, Rivera, Amori Rivera. And he got abducted by some dark-skinned ETs and he's going to tell his story. It's an incredible story and to boot this gentleman actually got some photos of his abductors before they took off. Truly incredible. We're going to get into his story and see what he has to say. But before that, I want to say this real quick. I woke up this morning, and it's, and it's very rare that I have the Spirit put on me to this level. But the Most High put His Spirit on me to let you guys know, guys, we really are in our final hour. He wanted me to make that very clear, that we are in the last hour. And it's as if I'm the bartender at the bar saying, last call. This is it. Last call. Last call. Because this place is about to get shut down. Last call. That's how urgent this is. This is not something to be taken lightly, Israel. The Most High put that on my spirit to let you guys know that, okay? Okay. Let's get into this video. On the morning of May 14, 1988, Amori Riviera, a young man from Puerto Rico, photographed a giant disc, followed and circled by two jet interceptors. What makes the sensational pictures even more interesting is Riviera's claim that he had contact with the occupants of this UFO. Hello, my name is uh, Amori Rivera. I live in Puerto Rico. And back in 1988, uh, I was working in a nightclub and uh, there was a, a musical group there. One of my cousins wanted me to photograph the musical group, and she loaned me a camera with some film. On my way back home, uh, I encountered uh, two small uh, beings, two small strange men, which I didn't think were uh, men from outer space. And uh, they took me somewhere where there were other people uh, besides myself. Uh, uh, other human people, like from Puerto Rico, I guess. Uh, from here, another human being showed up. He claimed to be from a distant planet. He was dressed in black. He had a dark skin, but he was he was not a Negro. He had a, a black, long black hair up to the shoulders, and he spoke to us uh, with the mouth uh, verbally, and no, no telepathic speaking. Uh, he showed us uh, various uh, uh, projections. Uh, which looked uh, very real, the projections, and he informed us about a whole bunch of things that are even still incredible to me. Uh, then uh, he, they returned me to... What did this holographic projection show? Uh, the holographs uh, were mainly... Uh, the first one that I can remember was a, uh, like a short trip uh, through space, uh, we saw where he, he came from, where he's said to be from. We saw his people, we saw his, his, the houses that they used. And, and the second one was about uh, a meteor or a rock falling to Earth in the near future, which is going to cause a lot of um, havoc in, in the world. This would fall, in, it's going to fall in, in very near the, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and those um, other small islands. But it's going to affect the whole world, not just uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the last one is, is, uh, that they projected it was uh, showing us how there was only going to be one government on, on the planet Earth. Uh, they'll be living on some sort of artificial island uh, that's going to be floating in the middle of a dark, black, uh, dirty sea. Uh, and then uh, this man uh, returned me uh, to uh, my, my car again and left me somewhere different from where the whole uh, ordeal had started. Apparently, they uh, 
took me with car and all. Uh, after this, at this given time, I l heard some jets in the sky, and I still had my cousin's camera, and I took uh, the pictures, uh, four of which are I'm, I'm making public nowadays. So this is amazing. You can see these pictures right here. Here is the so-called UFO. You have a jet here, and he said he had another picture. That he said, or they, he said he had another image, and there was three jets in the picture. But he thinks he only got one, so that might be the only one that shows a jet in the picture. But that's truly amazing. And then you're going to hear another gentleman later on uh, who authenticates this photos. So the jets followed the UFO. Yes, it was. Uh, they seem to be uh, uh, surveilling it. Uh, I only got to uh, capture just one of the, the, the jets in the photograph, but there were actually there were three of them. Uh, or, or maybe I got in one of the photos one, and in the second or third I got one of the other ones, because they would go around it very far away, and while this one was closer, and turn, you know, very far, very far. And by the time this one was coming back, another one was turning over there. There was always one or the other close to the, to the object, to the UFO. Jorge Martin has carefully investigated this case. Jorge Rivera's case is, to me, is a very special one and a very important one because uh, in a Morris case, he was abducted and he was taken away by aliens. One of them was human-like and two small creatures that they explained to him were some type of uh, genetical or biological organic android that they made to do some chores outside so they don't have to uh, risk themselves in our environment. That's what they explained to him, the so-called human alien that he saw in the craft. And it's important also because of the evidences that he has on the case, because when he was released, he had a camera with him, and he was able to take pictures of the object that apparently had abducted him, the craft, flying saucer type. And also, some jet fighters from the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, F-14 again. In most of these cases in the island, F-14s are involved with these situations of chasing and harassment and, and checking on these objects when they are seen in the different areas of the island. And they, he was able to get them in those pictures together. So this clearly, when you see those photographs, it's obvious that the government has been lying for many years because there's the youth there. And there's also the jet fighters dealing with the situation, which they denied for more than four years. Is there? Yeah, we all know Esau has been trying to hide the truth from Israel and from the, the public for a very long time. But the Most High Yahweh is going to bring it out, and he's going to bring it out in a big way. And so now it's time, Israel, to follow the laws and commandments of the Most High. Do what he has asked us to do and get ready because it is about to go down. And the Most High is putting me, putting this on my spirit hard today to get this through to, to you guys. This is no joke. This is no laughing matter. He is not playing. He put our ass in slavery for 850 plus years because we were not listening to him. We were not following his laws and commandments. He is not playing when he comes back with his armada of uh, so-called UFOs and chariots and his angels. He is not playing. Were you able to locate any other witnesses? That's what I was going to, to explain at this moment, Michael. Uh, the Amoris case is also very important because I have other several people who apparently had been contacted by the same alien that abducted Amori and the small ones that were with him in a, in a separate uh, fashion. They have nothing to do with Amoris incident. This being, this human-like alien, is contacting people all around the area of the southwest of Puerto Rico. I have people from the town of Yauco who seem to have been contacted by this man. I have this fisherman, Andres Maldonado, uh, who I got in contact with Amori because he told me several things Amori had told no one before, only I knew them, about the name of the alien and all the details that he was using to check on the people who really may have been in contact he said, with the same being denied, he was abducted because there were about 14 other people there in the craft that night. And when Mandonado told me all this information that he couldn't know because it was, he was not involved with the Morris case, uh, I got them together. And at this moment, I have about three different people 
who seem to have been in contact with the same alien. So they are doing something and they are getting in contact with more and more people and preparing people for something. And this is very important because all this corroborates Amari's incident also. Mr. Martin, are there any official statements regarding the incidents in Puerto Rico? As a matter of fact, uh, due to the situation happening in the southwest of Puerto Rico, it's all around the island, but in the southwest it's more obvious and more, more visible because of the many incidents that are happening there constantly. And it's a heavily populated area. Uh, the police and the civil defense and the authorities uh, began a very intensive disinformation program trying to ridicule and to make everything seen as a lie, as fabrication by those people who were informing all of this. Uh, but fortunately, after they began doing this, especially the civil defense agency in Puerto Rico, a source of ours uh, gave us this letter that was sent secretly by the state director of the civil defense agency of Puerto Rico, Colonel Jose M. Enoya, in which he states clearly that the situation is real, that they are keeping an eye on the situation and investigating everything, uh, just to, to be sure that this, what is happening and these sightings and this incident with UFOs and USOs, unknown submerged, submerged objects also, because they come out from, this, from the sea and, uh, and into the sea. Many people have seen this happen there. Uh, it's not a threat to the, to the security of the people of Puerto Rico on the Puerto Rican territory. As you know, something that doesn't exist can be a threat to anyone. There's also another thing. He says here that uh, several agencies of, the, of Puerto Rico are involved in the investigation secretly, the military, the radio observatory of Arecibo, and they have always denied for many years that they had anything to you to do uh, whatever with the UFO situation, and it's stated here by him that they do have something to do and they are checking on the situation. And Mr. Noya, these words written by him are very important because he's the liaison between the Puerto Rico uh, the National Guard Army and the Defense Intelligence Agency. He's their man in Puerto Rico. Yes, and the Defense Intelligence Agency is like the CIA in the military. So he knows what he's talking about. Other witnesses contacted Amari himself. Yeah, so far, uh, between 1988 and 1992, I've been able to localize seven of these people uh, because I've gone on different uh, uh, TV shows and uh, different articles, and I've, uh, I've always uh, been asking if anybody remembers anything similar uh, happening to them and that year, during that time, Mother's Day, to please get in touch with me. And I have gotten in touch with hundreds of people, but out of the hundreds, uh, seven definitely were there uh, with me. I still have uh, seven to go. Maybe I'll never uh, find them. Maybe, maybe they'll see this. You investigated the Rivera case, Colonel Stevens. What was your impression? Well, of course, Jorge Martin took me to meet Jorge Rivera, or, uh, Amari Rivera, uh, shortly after I got there with the Mexican team to study some phenomena in Puerto Rico. And when I first met Amari, he was very uh, reluctant to describe his case because it still frightened him to think about it. And it took some time before we could uh, develop enough confidence where he was comfortable talking to us about the case. But he would still tremble when he thought about it. He would, would turn pale. He'd become weak. He, uh, uh, he was frightened. But he has now reviewed the details and the points in sufficient length and depth that he can, can face the experience without the trauma, which he has, has learned to do. And today, or yesterday, we saw for the first time that he is able to, to manage his emotions well enough to describe that contact in considerable detail. You carefully analyzed the Rivera photographs. We took the pictures, yes. We took the pictures taken by Amari Rivera to a NASA, consult, a NASA consultant facility 
in Scottsdale, where we put them through a computer analysis using latest state-of-the-art equipment. And we found that both the disc-shaped craft seen in the photographs and the aircraft are some considerable distance from the camera, between three and five miles. We discovered that the jet fighter was moving and that the disc-shaped craft was moving relatively slow or not moving at all. We discovered that uh, the ambient light conditions were correct in all respects. We were able to eliminate montages, paste-ups, reflections, models, all kinds of forms of technical uh, manipulation of photographs. And we had to conclude that the pictures were real and that they were exactly as described by the witness when he took the photographs. Actually, Amuri Rivera was intimidated and pressured by government agents to hand over his pictures. Well, a, a short time after, after the, the incident, a, a three men uh, showed up at my home in Puerto Rico, and one of them stood in their car downstairs. And uh, they claimed to be uh, from a uh, CIA. And they gave me, they handed me two pieces of paper, which I was so nervous I couldn't really read, but I remember seeing the, the letter CIA, which is uh, the intelligence agency from the United States, and uh, they said that it would be easier and better for me if I handed them the photographs and the negatives. But they did not say, you know, what photographs or what negatives. Uh, they didn't specify. And I just told them that I did not know what they were talking about. They said it, it would be easier because we have a, the, uh, an order for to register your house, to look through your house. And I said, well, go ahead, be my guest and look. And they, they looked, but they couldn't find them because I had, I had hit them very well. So there you have it. Thank you for that, Amore Rivera. That's an incredible story. It's, very, it's a very uh, great thing that he was able to hide those photos. We have photographic evidence to see here today. Of course, we know it's all real, but it just helps to uh, substantiate, substantiate the claims. Incredible story. Thank you for that. So next, we have a young alleged Christian boy who died on a surgeon's table. And he died for a few minutes and he went to uh, heaven. And so what he's going to give his story of what he saw. And this is a racist Klansman's son, who they're, who they're both in the KKK. And so the Most High Yahweh put it on this boy's spirit to give his uh, story of what he saw in heaven. Let's get into it, Israel. Let's see what this young little racist boy has to say. Shalom, Israel. This is the article I came across. And it's entitled, Racist Boy Dies for Three Minutes and Says Jesus is a Nigger. Now listen to this. A young white Christian boy who briefly died on a surgeon's operating table during a liver transplant this past weekend says he met Jesus Christ and he was an African American. A Negro. Billy, Billy Landers, the son of a well-known KKK member in Mobile, Alabama, who was suffering from liver failure, was technically dead for three minutes before being resuscitated. During that time, the 13-year-old claims he visited the afterlife. Quote, this is what he's saying he's, he's seeing. He says, it was all niggers. He told WKRG News after the ordeal. Quote, there were a few white people, but they were just entertaining the blacks, like just like playing basketball. There were a lot of nigger angels watching them play basketball, Landers said. Quote, Jesus was a coon too. Jesus wasn't white like daddy says he is. He says, I asked my father, why is Jesus a nigger? He couldn't answer. He says, I thought, I've been taught that God and Jesus hate niggers. That God cursed them by turning their skin black. That they were mud people. Billy's father said his son's experience had, had not made him question white supremacy and an Anglo-Saxon Jesus. Quote, he says, it kind of disturbs me that he came back with stories of nigger heaven, he told reporters. But clearly my son is suffering from, sort of, from some sort of schizophrenia or something. There's no way Jesus is a nigger. 
I'm going to have to put my boy on antipsychotic medications. This white boy said he died and went to heaven and said he met Jesus. And Jesus was a nigger, was a negro. <laughs> Excuse me. These white people know that, that the Most High is black. We are a chosen seed, Negroes. Now, this is another link that I came across. And it's entitled uh, Truth Over Tradition.com. I have this guy's book. Let's click on Jesus and see what he says. Undeniable biblical proof that Yahushua, Jesus, or Yahweh Shai, is black. Says why this is not he said why this is not Jesus and why it matters. All the last we've been taught that Jesus is a blue eyed, blonde haired white man. And it says this image of a white Messiah appears in all churches across America, especially in the black church. Okay, it says although Colors are a uh, subject that is highly avoided today in white supremacist society. The Bible contains detailed narratives on the physical appearance and skin color of God's chosen people, the Hebrew Israelites. But in order to stay on topic today, I, he says, I will only be discussing the color of Messiah and who the world calls Jesus. Let's keep on going. Do your history on, on, on what happened through the whitewashing, right? All the people in the Bible are black, so what happened? Okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about my next video what Hitler said about the biblical Jews of the Bible and what they look like uh, and we're going to talk about where white people come from I have this guy's book and he goes into that now let's keep on going so it says it now listen to this it says the famous first century writer Josephus penned the earliest non-biblical testimony of whom we call Jesus Josephus was a black Jew who lived around the time of the Messiah and he, report, and he, and he had access to the official Roman records in which he bases information and his work from. In his work, the human form, quote, it says, the human form of Jesus and his wonderful works. Josephus discussed the true color of the Messiah being black. However, his texts were passed through the hands of white European Christian leaders who altered them to hide the truth about the Messiah and who his people were. Fortunately, however, biblical scholar Robert Eichler, in a classical 1931 study of Josephus' testimony, was able to re reconstruct an unaltered testimony based on a newly discovered old Russian translation that preserved the original Greek text. According to Ezra's reconstruction, the non-biblical description of Jesus reads as follows. At that time there also appeared a certain man of magic power, if it be me to call him a man, whose name is Jesus, whom certain Greeks called the son of a god. His disciples called the true prophet. He was a man of simple appearance, mature age, black skin, short growth, three cubits tall, hunchback, panacathous with a long face, a long nose, eyebrows meeting above the nose, with scanty curly hair, but having a line in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazarenes, with an underdeveloped beard. Now I have this book, it's called Jesus the Messiah and John the, uh, the Messiah Jesus is John the Baptist. Now what he just described sounds nothing like that Caesar Bourget looking you know fake image looks nothing like the matthew mcconaughey looking jesus of hollywood keeps trying to sell everybody every uh hollywood motion pictures what do you see you see it all whitewash everybody looking looking like pale uh, pale skin edomites you know it's time that we get the truth out israel and it's time that we work really hard to wake our people up because we are in the last days and time is short this isn't the time to be looking at these type of videos as entertainment you know this is just another type of x-file to you and oh yeah, yeah this is amazing no this is the time to be sharing these type of videos with people who are still sleeping and get them woke up because we don't have time to mess around anymore the most high is putting it on my spirit to put this stuff together so you guys can go out there and wake up other people this is a, a you know a, a group effort this is up to everybody to wake up the house of israel because if we don't do it nobody else will it says, this short, black-skinned, mature, hunchback Jesus with a unibrow, short curly hair, and undeveloped developed beard bears no resemblance to the Jesus Christ taken for granted today by most Christian, by most of the Christian world. That tall hair, that tall, 
haired, long blonde, blue eyed white boy. It says, yet this earliest textual record matches well their earliest iconographic evidence. The earliest visual depiction of Jesus is a painting that was found in 1921 on, on the wall of the baptismal chamber of the house church at Dura Yopa, Syria, and dated around 235 AD. This picture is of this picture of Jesus is called the healing of the paralytic and displays him and displays him as a being short and dark skinned with a small curly afro. This description has now been supported by new science of forensic anthropology. Let's click on this image. What does it, it look like? There he is. This little how you how shy short dude. Let's keep on going. In 2002, British forensic scientists and Israeli archaeologists reconstructed what they believe is the most accurate image of Jesus based off, the, based off data obtained from the Mulch Disciplinary Approach. In December 2002, Popular Science Magazine published a cover story on the findings which confirmed that Jesus would have been short around 5'7 to 5'9, uh, short hair with tight curls, a weather, a weather beaten face which would have made him appear older. Dark eyes, dark complexion. It says the textual, visual, and scientific evidence agrees. Then Jesus was Jesus was likely short, dark skin, Hebrew Israelite with short, curly, woolly hair, and dark eyes. See that? It's a Negro. The most high is a Negro. His children are we are, are Negroes. We are made in the image of our heavenly Father and His Son. Now who's this white boy? Cedar Borger. Do your research on this dude. This is not Christ. Right? It's not Christ. It's a, it's a false messiah. It's, it says the messiah, the black messiah in the Bible, in Revelation 1, 14 and 15, his head and his hair are white, pure like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if we find in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Okay? And Daniel gives the same description. Okay, so it says, some might say, well, so what if the Messiah is black? Color doesn't matter. But that is an ignorant point of view. If color didn't matter, then why would they go through all that trouble to paint our Messiah their color? Obviously, color does matter. If it didn't, they would have left him black and told our ancestors the truth, who the people of the book were. Instead, they lied to them. They told them lies so they can pass those lies down to us in hopes that we would never find out that Yahushua or Yahawashai whom the world calls Jesus was black and that we are God's chosen people whom the entire Bible was written about. See that? I'm going to post this in my description box and I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about what Adolf Hitler said. What did he say? Thank you for that brother. Of course I'll leave all the links down below so you guys can check out the sources for this video. Of course Esau you know, went in and changed all the, the the prophets of the Bible into white folks. That was so that they could perpetrate the whole idea of so-called white supremacy and have uh, the nation of Israel bowing down to this so-called nation of white supremacy. It was a very calculated and devious attempt to control the nation of Israel. But now the nation of Israel is waking up to all the games that have been played the Most High Yahweh is putting it on the spirit of the nation of Israel to wake up and we have to all do our part people. Everybody has a part to play in Yahweh's grand script. This is Yahweh's script and we're all playing a part in his script and it's up to us to wake up our people. It's up to us to love our people because like I said in previous videos, if we don't love our people, who the, who the hell will? Who will love us? It's up to us to love our people. It's up to us to educate us. It's no, it's no longer you know, kosher to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. That, that's, that's done. We need, to be, we need to start gaining knowledge and understand who we are and, and what we're supposed to do here. The time is short. You know, Yahweh has put that on my spirit so hard today. So I had to bring it through. I'm probably going to make a separate video just on that because he's bringing it through so hard. The time is short. The time to be playing games is, is, is over and done with. It's time to detach from Esau's world of madness and folly. That there's no future in Esau's mad world of madness and folly. That world is coming to an end. It's coming to a close. It's time to ch close that chapter and get ready for a new chapter, Israel. The Most High Yahweh is getting ready to come do his thing. 
and he's not playing. He's not messing around. He's not going to negotiate. You're not going to sit before a jury of your peers and discuss anything. He's just coming to get down, and that's all he's going to do. He's not going to ask any questions, nothing. He's just coming to get down and kicking butt and taking names. And you don't, you don't want to be on that list, the kick butt list. You don't want to be on that list. You want to have something in your good works basket so when he, you know, when he comes, you'll be good. It's, it's, it's a serious game. This is a serious time right now, Israel. This is very serious, and the time is short. Okay? All right. I hope everybody is doing well out there. Everybody listens to these warnings. I mean, you're, you're not just hearing from me. You're hearing these warnings, you know, all across the board from, from, from just, you know, just about everybody's telling you that the time is short. But it really is. And if you're trying to play this game where you're going to outsmart Yahweh and, you know, oh, well, this prophecy hasn't been filled and you got your little prophecy checklist, you know, planning your vacations around the prophecies. Yeah, I still got time to take this vacation. I still got time for this. No, he can fill a prophecy in a matter of days or a day if he wants. Yahweh can do what he wants to do. He's put the, he put the spirit on that racist KKK uh, little boy. He can do what he wants to do. We need to get it out of our heads that we're going to outsmart Yahweh. Nobody's going to outsmart Yahweh. He, he, that's what Esau has in his head. He thinks he's going to outsmart Yahweh. Nobody is going to outsmart Yahweh. Yahweh already, he's already a thousand moves ahead of what, we, what we're thinking. So it's time to take this serious, Israel, and love each other. Nobody else is going to do it. We have to do it. Okay? All right. Shalom out there.